But far be it from me to boast, except in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ, by which the world has been crucified unto me and I unto the world. Golgotha, Calvary, the place of the skull. Jesus Christ and Him crucified is the bottom line to Christianity. Without Christ and His cross, not only are you unprepared to die, but you're unprepared to live. And the world we live in is starving for life-giving sustenance. And the answer is for us as His church to give the world a vision of Jesus Christ and Him crucified. Christ crucified is the center of it all. And so we want to focus on the cross today and also for the next several weeks. And I may never ask you to do this again, but I want you to, I want you to go ahead and put your Bible up. Turn off your electronic device or put it on the pew beside you. Put down the pen or the pencil and the paper that you may be thinking you want to take notes with today. Some sermons are for the intellect. But this sermon is for the heart. And I want to reach down very deeply today and try to plant the cross in your heart. And Luke said in Luke 23, 33, when they came to the place that is called the skull, there they crucified him. Luke looked up at Golgotha. And he was so awed and so overpowered and so overwhelmed that he was nearly speechless. And all that he could say was, there, they crucified him. I don't know if I'll ever go to Jerusalem. But if I do, and I make my way out on that road up to that hill, that skull-shaped rock, I'm sure that's all I'll be able to say as well. There, they crucified him. Right there. Right there is where God in the flesh died on a cross. This is no philosophy. This is no myth. This is no alternative truth. This is gospel. This is the absolute truth. And the worst thing that ever happened is the best thing that ever happened for you and me. And so I want to encourage you to clear your mind, to relax for a moment, and digest the cross. I want us to divide the story of the cross into six scenes today. Scene one. Scene one is the upper room. It was time for the annual Passover feast, and Jesus told his, some of His disciples, Peter and John to be specific, to go to Jerusalem. And when they got to Jerusalem that day, He said, You will see a man carrying a water pot, and I want you to follow that man because He's going to take you to the room where we're going to have our, our feast of the Passover. For you and me to understand the significance of that moment, we need to put, take off our our 21st century glasses and put on 1st century glasses. We need to understand how significant this prophecy that Jesus just made to them was. Because in the 1st century, men did not carry water pots. It just wasn't done. Like it or not, whether it was right or wrong or indifferent, carrying a water pot was a woman's job. It was not a man's job. But today it was a man's job. And God did not want them to mistake for a moment who it was that they were supposed to follow. Notice the events of the upper room. As they came together in that room after the preparation was made, and Jesus sat down with them, and they all sat down. And He said these words, I have earnestly desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. Historically, we know that it was customary to have a servant at the door to wash feet when you were hosting a meal or people in your home. But none was provided on this occasion. 
Luke records that instead of providing that, the disciples were sitting around fussing over who was the greatest. And without saying a word, Jesus walked over and took off his outer garment and picked up a towel and began to show them what true greatness looked like. He showed them amazing humility by accomplishing the bondservant's task. And in accomplishing the bondservant's task, he practiced what he preached earlier in the Sermon on the Mount. Because he not only, he not only loved his enemy, but he served his enemy, Judas. And then he instituted what we call the Lord's Supper. He broke the bread and he blessed it and he said, This is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And then he took the cup of wine and said, This cup is poured out for you. Remember me. He went on to predict his betrayal. Someone's going to betray me tonight. Somebody in this room. And they all said, Is it I? Lord, is it I? Even Judas spoke up and said, Lord, is it I? And Jesus said, it is the one who's dipping bread into the dish with me. And then he sent Judas out of the room and he said, get on with what you have to do. And while they were in this upper room setting, Jesus predicts Peter's denial. And you remember Peter's reaction. Lord, I don't care what all the rest of these scoundrels do. I will never deny you. Not in a million years. The text says they sang a hymn and went out. And Christianity began with a song. Christianity has always been carried on the wings of a song. And songs like the one we just sang, O Sacred Head, remind us just how special music is in preparing your mind and your heart to embrace and commune with God, and Jesus, and the Holy Spirit. Jesus and his small band of disciples came across the temple area. Then they exited through the Golden Gate out of Jerusalem, crossing the brook Kidron. And that brings us to scene two. Scene two is the garden. And in the garden on the Mount of Olives, there was this garden called Gethsemane. And Jesus had permission to use this garden. I know this is true because John chapter 18 tells us he used it very often. That's how Judas knew where he would be. He went there all the time. And when they got to the garden, Christianity went from a song to a prayer. And Jesus needed to pray because he was in terrible agony. The Bible tells us he was in such agony, it was even to the point of death. And so he left eight of the disciples in one place, and he took Peter, James, and John with him just a little further in, and he asked them to stay awake and watch with him and pray with him. He needed them to be in prayer with him. The Bible says that Jesus' prayer was so intense that sweat came off his head like great drops of blood. Was he afraid to die? I don't think he was. I think he was so agonized, so intensely, because he who had never sinned was about to become all sin for all time, for all mankind, including mine and yours. And the sin I did last week, and the sin I did yesterday, and the sin I did this morning, and the sin I'll do tomorrow. And he was going to have to carry that burden all alone. No man heard that prayer that night because the three who could have heard were asleep. Only God heard it. And that's really all that's important when it comes to prayer is that God hears prayer and He hears your prayer. But you know what? If those three could have lived their lives over again, if they could have lived this moment in time over again, I'm pretty sure they would have stayed awake to hear this prayer from the Son of God. We only have a piece of the prayer, but what a prayer that must have been. Can you imagine? 
You ever wonder what that was like? When Jesus found them sleeping for the third time, he said, The spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. And you know what I find amazing is that Jesus didn't ask for new apostles. Instead, he told these men of failure, Arise, let us go. And I find a great bit of comfort in that because the church consists of flawed and faulty people. And God doesn't ask for new disciples. He doesn't ask for new people. He's content to use you and He's content to use me for His glory and for His fame. And He uses us anyway. And this is the fact of the cross. God putting life into death, turning failure into victory. And just look at your own life and you know I'm telling you the truth. The agony of the garden was terrible. I can't even imagine it. But there was no other way. Some folks think God could have chosen another way to redeem mankind, to save man in another way, to save people another way, but that's just not true. To destroy Jesus Christ, the Son of God, when there were other alternatives available, would be fiendish of God. God did not kill Jesus just so it would look good. It was absolutely necessary because it demonstrates the magnitude of sin and the majesty of grace. Scene three. Scene three is the arrest. And as the mob approached Jesus that night with torches and clubs led by Jesus or Judas, the man who sold out, you can only imagine what was racing through his mind. I'm sure all the, the noise and the clamor and the, the chatter and the shouting had those sleepy disciples fully awake at this point. As a sign of the mob, Judas came up to the Lord and he kissed him, of all things. And even at this point, Jesus gave Judas an out. Because he asked him, would you betray the Son of Man with a kiss? You know what I think that was? I think Jesus was saying, Judas, you can still run away from this. You can still escape. You don't have to do it. No man was ever warned as much as Judas. And that is the magnanimous nature, the grace of God. Warning after warning after warning. We're given in life. And today God gives those who are unfaithful and those who are disobedient. Warning after warning after warning. For which I am grateful, by the way. Jesus asked the mob, Whom do you seek? And they said, Jesus of Nazareth. And he said, I am he. And they all fell down. They all fell to the ground. And you might wonder why. Why would they fall? Did the earth move? Did it shake? Did it quake? What caused them to fall? I believe they fell down because no one could stand before God in the flesh. When you're confronted with the reality that this is God, I am, is standing before you, they couldn't stand. Reminds me of what Paul told the Philippian church in Philippians chapter 2, starting in verse 9, that God had given him the name that is above every name, that the name of Jesus, every knee should bow and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God, the Father. And this is a precursor to that. Peter, valiantly, bravely, pulled his sword, cut off Malchus's ear, 
and then he melted like butter. And all the disciples ran away. The text says they all deserted him and fled, just like Jesus said they would. But here's Jesus, total command of the moment, stoops down and picks up the ear of Malchus, puts it back on his head, and heals it. Do you think Malchus was ever the same after that? I don't know for sure what happened with Malchus, but I guarantee you he was confronted with the grace of God that day. And there Jesus was, left all alone, still in command, but all alone. And after God said no to his prayer, Jesus said yes to the cross. And he said, I lay down my life willingly. No man takes it from me. The cross was no accident. It was no mistake. And it fulfilled the eternal plan of heaven. And even though he melted like butter, Peter followed at a distance. Three times he denied that he even knew Jesus with his mouth. And the rooster crowed. And Jesus turned. The crowd was parted, and he made eye contact with Peter. And Peter just went out and wept. Here's the attitude of the cross. Church, God does not use perfect people. He never has he never will. He uses the imperfect. Later on, Peter accepted forgiveness, and this is exactly what the world needs to know. This is why Peter could stand and preach on the day of Pentecost a few days later, because he had experienced and had accepted what he was preaching. And I want you to know that preachers do not preach because they're brilliant or because they're eloquent or because they study the Scriptures more than you. They preach because they are human, forgiven sinners who have accepted grace and experienced sin and failure and flaws on a daily basis. And this is the cross of Jesus and His message. Peter knew firsthand the reality of grace. He knew that we were saved by it. You need to know that too. And you need to never forget that. And we need to cut each other some slack. The cross is God accepting man at his second best. Our God is the God of from now on. He takes us where we are, not where he wishes we were, because God salvages, God recycles, God is the original recycler. He builds lives uh, from ashes. He turns failure into a future. And He'll do the same for you, just like He did for Peter. That brings us to scene four. Scene four, we see Jesus before the authorities. Jesus went before a variety of people. There were so many people in authority in this day and time. It took Him all night to see them all. They took him first to Caiaphas, or excuse me, Annas. Took him first to Annas. Annas wasn't even high priest. He was retired. He was high priest emeritus, but he was still in control. He couldn't turn loose of the control. So he was still the guy in charge. By the way, the real high priest, Caiaphas, was his son-in-law. So it was pretty easy to control him. They took him before Annas. Then they took him before Caiaphas. Then they took him before the Sanhedrin. The Sanhedrin was like the Supreme Court for the Jews. Seventy different folks sitting in the seats of judgment. They had an illegal night meeting. It was against their own law for the Sanhedrin to convene at night. It had to be during daylight hours. They broke their own law in order to make the kangaroo court work. Then he went before the chief priests. The chief priests were the big-name preachers. 
the ones that the brotherhood all wanted to read what they wrote. Then he went before the scribes. The scribes were the were the lawyers. It was a horrible night. And before Israel's finest, Jesus was slapped and ridiculed, spit upon. How humiliating. No man has ever been tried like God tried himself. Someone might say, well, where was God when my, when my baby died? Or where was God when my son died? Or where was God when my mother died? I'll tell you where God is. The same place He was when His own son died. God feels our pain. It's not lost on Him. Law and justice and decency were all disregarded on this night before the authorities. This is man at his worst, God at its best. Satan pulled out all the stops in order to defeat Jesus, gathered up some false witnesses, and they were paid, and it still took them all night long before they could find two who could agree on any charge against Jesus. Then they brought him to Pilate. Pilate could find no crime in him. And yet the Jews kept insisting on death. Pilate's wife said, don't have anything to do with this man. I have had a nightmare tonight because of him. Leave it alone. But Pilate was a wimp. He fumbled the ball and passed him off to Herod. And when Jesus was before Herod, Herod questioned him repeatedly. Over and over, asking questions, getting no answer at all. Jesus didn't even acknowledge His presence. Herod was like a lot of folks today. He wanted to see a miracle. Oh, I'll believe what you got to offer, but I want to see, I want to see a miracle first. I want to see what's in it for me. He wanted a magic show. And Jesus knew that. And so He didn't even acknowledge His existence. So Herod sent him back to Pilate. Three times Pilate tried to release Jesus. He had him scourged. And then he brought him before the people, perhaps to incite pity. And he said, Behold the man. In other words, is this not enough blood? He's a mess. Look at him. And all that did was make him angrier. You know, anger can be caused by shame. You know that, right? Anger can be caused by guilt. When you're faced with your own sin, someone points it out to you. It's not unusual just to get mad about it. And scourging was a terrible ordeal. Luke doesn't really go into great detail about this because everybody who was alive in the first century to whom he was writing knew all about it. It was a gory ordeal. It included a, a, a whip called a flagellum. And the flagellum had nine cords on it. And there were knots on the end of each cord. And embedded in those knots were bits of bone and metal. And the person who was be receiving a scourging was bent over a post, a whipping post. And they were chained by their wrists down low on the post so that all that was exposed was their back and it was stretched and taunt. And the Roman soldiers would whip with this flagellum. And they had no limit. They would whip until they were tired. And sometimes they would tag team. And they would say, I'm, anybody else want to give it a go? And he handed off to the other soldier and he would whip until he was tired. And before they were done, there was blood and shredded flesh and exposed organs, and most people died in a scourging. And then the soldiers, you know, they had their fun and games after the fact, and that just added to the torture, and they mocked him, put on a purple robe, made him a crown of thorns, and they... 
smashed that into his scalp. And, and it was already sore and hurting, and he was, had a headache from dehydration and the beating he just received. And they'd hit him over the head with a reed, driving those thorns deeper into the scalp. And that's what Jesus looked like when Pilate said, Behold the man. For the third time, the people were asked, What shall I do with Jesus? Tradition was, at the Feast of the Passover, Pilate was obliged to release one prisoner for the Jewish people as a show of benevolence from Rome. And they asked for Barabbas, and Barabbas was the worst of the worst. He was a murderer. He was an insurrectionist. He had already tried to overthrow Rome. And he had killed innocent people in the process. And already we see Jesus setting men free from their sins. I don't know what happened to Barabbas, but I'm thinking he was never the same again either. But concerning Jesus, they shouted, Let Him be crucified! His blood be upon us and our children. And like the wimpy was, Pilate relented and washed his hands of the whole affair. Scene 5. Scene 5 is a short scene. It's the cross journey. But it must have been a long journey for our Lord. Exhausted from no sleep, weak from blood loss, pain screaming through every fiber of every muscle, blood leaking into his eyes, encrusted in his nose and his mouth, blood-soaked garments sticking to his wounds with every movement. Reminder of the beating. All through the city, up the hill, with continual ridicule, he carried his own cross. But as Tim read the Scripture a moment ago, even in the middle of that, he took the time to console some crying women. That is the selfless mind of Jesus Christ at work. And then Simon of Cyrene was compelled to carry his cross. What a privilege that was for him. He was never the same. And that brings us to scene six. Scene six is the cross, the crucifixion. Look at Jesus on the cross. It's not just a, a picture in some old Sunday school card. It's not just a scene from a movie. It is history. It is the pivotal point in history. And much could be said describing the horror of crucifixion, the swollen tongue, the hot throat, the dehydrated body, the lack of oxygen due to the inability to breathe properly, the intense pain of the headache and the nails are all part of the crucifixion. What I'd like you to look at are the scars. See the ones on his head? The crown punctured his scalp. See the ones in his hands and his feet where the nails gored him? Can you see the big one in his side where they savagely speared him after he was already dead? There's one more I want you to see. You have to look more closely. It's the scar of his heart. That's where your sins and mine burst it. And Luke simply said, There they crucified him. 
There were the final words, and we'll spend more time on them next week. Father, forgive them. Today you'll be with me in paradise. Woman, behold your son. Behold your mother. My God, why hast thou forsaken me? I thirst. It is finished. Into thy hands I commit my spirit. And then there were the miracles. The veil of the temple was torn from the top to the bottom. And the top was so high that only God could reach that and rip that curtain. And now nothing stands between fallen mankind and God. The sun refused to shine. Dead men walked. And a hardened centurion said, This, this is the Son of God. And when they came to the place which is called the skull, there they crucified Him. Jesus said, And I, when I am lifted up from the earth, will draw all men unto Myself. I want you to know today I have tried to lift him up high so we would remember. Do you want to respond to the cross of Jesus Christ? When you come to be baptized into Christ, when you come to repent of sin, when you come to ask for prayer, you are coming to the foot of the cross of Jesus Christ. Do you want to respond to that? Do you need to respond to that today? I want to encourage you to do that. I'd like to take his hand in mine and say, Christ, you died for me. Thank you for suffering upon the cruel tree, though others may perhaps forget, I give my all to Thee. Would you like to say that today? If so, would you come forward while we stand and sing?